Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to the May 2006 broadcast. In our last study, we looked at 14 specifications concerning the 144,000. Because some people are watching today's show for the first time, I'm going to do a quick review of a few specifications. Let me take you to the computer screen so that you can follow along. The number 144,000 is a literal number and the 12 tribes of Israel are also a literal number and the tribes themselves are literal. The problem here is that many Christians aren't aware of the fact that God redefined Israel at the cross. According to the New Covenant, the Israel of God is made up of believers in Jesus Christ. These are the heirs of Abraham, Galatians 3, 28 and 29. In other words, as far as God is concerned, the 12 tribes are people who have circumcised hearts. Physical circumcision means nothing to God, nor does it have anything to do with being an heir of the promise given to Abraham. Point number two, shortly before the commencement of the Great Tribulation, God will thoroughly test and choose 144,000 people from all over the world to be his prophets. These prophets will come from every language, religion, culture, and nation. In other words, Jesus will handpick 144,000 faithful, honest-hearted people from every walk of life to be his spokespersons during the Great Tribulation. By suddenly transforming 144,000 faithful, honest-hearted people from every religious body into believers in Christ, Jesus will have converted brothers and sisters speaking to their fellow brothers and sisters. This simple arrangement will overcome the world's greatest problem which is religious arrogance. The 144,000 will be both men and women. The book of Revelation says they will not be defiled by women. The idea here is not one of virginity or celibacy. This language, not being defiled by women, comes from an incident that is recorded in the book of Ezra. Many of the Levite priests married foreign women during the Babylonian captivity. This defiled the priests because the laws of Moses commanded them to choose a wife from among the twelve tribes of Israel. When temple services began functioning after the captivity, this contamination or this defilement of the priesthood was discovered and these priests were put to a very difficult situation. They could not serve the Lord unless they abandoned their foreign wives. You see, these priests were defiled by women. The parallel in our day is simple. When God selects the 144,000 to serve Him, their marriage, that is, their spouses' views and attitudes will not hold them back. If necessary, they will abandon their spouse to serve the Lord. For the most part, the 144,000 will be lowly people, humble people, not highly educated, just ordinary people upon whom the extraordinary power and authority of the Holy Spirit will rest. Few, if any, of the 144,000 will know each other, yet they will all say and do the same things. 
Most, if not all, of the 144,000 will die as martyrs during the Great Tribulation. There's a big problem with Jesus choosing ordinary people to make up the 144,000. Because the 144,000 will be widely scattered and have diverse religious backgrounds, because the 144,000 will be very ordinary people, unknown people to the media, if you will, because the 144,000 will not be a part of an organized religious body, a serious problem arises. How will billions of people be able to determine whether the 144,000 truly speak for God or whether they are just crazy people, perhaps demon-possessed? Remember, they asked that question of Jesus when he was on earth. So how does Jesus prove to a diverse world of many religions and cultures that the 144,000 really are his prophets speaking his words? The authenticity of God's servants will be affirmed by two infallible witnesses. The Bible will support everything they say, and the Holy Spirit will give their words unusual authority and power. For the honest in heart, God's two witnesses will be sufficient evidence that the 144,000 are speaking for Jesus. For the wicked, no evidence will be sufficient. Remember Pharaoh? Remember how he would not believe that Moses and Aaron spoke for Almighty God even after nine devastating plagues? The Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit will validate the message and the messengers that both are sent from Jesus. As first fruits of the end time harvest, Revelation 14 tells us the 144,000 are first fruits. This means the 144,000 will be the first to be sealed. They will be first to have their carnal natures removed. They will also be the first to be taken to heaven. After the 144,000 receive the seal of God, they will have no predisposition or proclivity for sin as human beings currently do. After they are sealed, the 144,000 will be like Adam and Eve before the fall. They will not be attracted towards sinning. Thus, the 144,000 will be living examples of God's promise to deliver everyone from the power of sin as well as the penalty of sin. Their selfless behavior and love for God and man will be a powerful influence upon those who listen to them. The 144,000 will present the gospel of Jesus Christ during the Great Tribulation. They will accomplish in a mere 1260 days more than all Christian missionaries have been able to accomplish in the past 2,000 years. The 144,000 are not and will not be self-appointed. They will be chosen, selected and chosen by Jesus himself. The conversion of the 144,000 will be similar to that of the Apostle Paul. Remember how he was on the road to Damascus when the Lord called him. Jesus will reveal himself to the people he chooses. He will speak with them and he will give them words to speak and miracle working powers so that their words will have weight. The 144,000 well, most of them will lose their lives during the Great Tribulation, if not all of them, but they will be resurrected and taken to heaven on the 1265th day of the Great Tribulation. As you can see, this is 70 days prior to the Second Coming. 144,000 are taken to heaven on the 1265th day. They will be presented to God as first fruits that is, a sample of the coming harvest. The last point that I'd like to say in the way of review here, why did God limit 
the number of last day prophets to a mere 144,000 people. Look, here's the population of the world, or we are fast approaching the 7 billion mark. And look how small the number, 144,000, is compared to 7 billion. This is a ratio of one prophet per 48,611 people. Well, why did God do it this way? I think there's an important object lesson in this number because the 144,000 will be a Gideon's army. You remember in Judges chapter 7, verse 12, the Bible says the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. This is talking about how the nations had gathered around Israel to destroy it. And the number gathered was enormous. This is in Gideon's day. And you know the story how the Lord used this humble man, Gideon, and he finally pared down the army willing to fight the Midianites to just a mere 300 men. And they ran into the camp one night, and they were shouting, Behold the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and a great victory followed. You know the story in Judges 7. The point here is that Gideon's attack produced the death of 120,000 of Israel's enemies. But the point here is that Gideon and his 300 men did not receive glory for this great victory over the Midianites and the Amalekites because everyone knew the odds were too great. Everyone knew that this victory was the work of God. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4, 6. So it will be. The Gospel Commission will be accomplished by God because it is humanly impossible. Jesus is going to leapfrog all Christian organizations by doing something very simple. He will choose ordinary people from every religion to be his prophets, his spokespersons for the end time. This simple plan of converted brothers and sisters speaking to their fellow brothers and sisters will produce a great harvest. God shows his love and compassion for us by selecting 144,000 ordinary men and women and empowering them to do the impossible. Notice this little piece of poetry I've written here. Now, you know I'm not a, pro a poet nor a prophet, but notice how this works. Speaking about the selection of the 144,000, he converts them, he seals them, he gives them words. He gives them power to save a numberless multitude. Thus, God circumvents some of the stubbornness and diversity of mankind for the sake of the honest in heart that live in every religion. The 144,000 will speak to their own people during a period of 1260 days. Converted brothers and sisters speaking to their fellow brothers and sisters enables the 144,000 to speak to their own. And when the dust finally settles, the harvest resulting from the work of the 144,000 will be a numberless multitude that comes out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. I think this is so wonderful. Using a minimum number of people God will save a maximum number of people during the Great Tribulation. What a merciful God. What a God of love. Okay, that constitutes our review. Now, with these things in mind, there are some adjacent issues concerning the 144,000 that we need to address today. Now, I'd like to just sort of catch my breath here for a moment. I know I flew through those, but... The 144,000 
um, have been a mystery to denominations and peoples and Bible students for 2,000 years, ever since the book of Revelation was written. And th there's two elements in the uh, book of Revelation that you have to get right if you're really going to understand anything about the whole prophecy that's written in the book of Revelation. You have to understand the 144,000 correctly, and you have to understand the seven trumpets correctly. If you can just get these two principal topics well surrounded and understood, everything else written in Revelation, the book of Revelation, will make perfect sense just as it's written. So that's why I've taken a, a, a serious amount of time to examine the 144,000. And as we will look at them and study them and their work and their mission and, and how God uses them to accomplish this harvest of a numberless multitude, then you will have a big part of Revelation's story in your mind already. Then later, we're going to study the seven trumpets and the outpouring of God's wrath and how God uses his wrath to open the minds and hearts of people who are searching for answers and how the 144,000 will be standing there to give them the answers. Okay, with those thoughts in mind, let's go back to our study here. And we're looking at some issues that are uh, adjacent to the study of the 144,000. If you have watched earlier sem seminar segments, you know why I say the seven angels that stand before God in Revelation 8-2 were given the seven trumpets in the spring of 1994. In that year, four of the seven angels, that is, those having the first four trumpets, they left the throne room and with power to hurt the earth and the sea and the trees, they came here prepared to do business. But before they could execute the intended harm, they were told to wait until the 144,000 were sealed. You can find this in Revelation 7, 1 through 4. We are currently living in this delay. As you might expect, this delay will come to an end. And the Bible tells us about the termination of this delay. It is found in Revelation 10.6. This is the declaration of where the delay ends. Notice this text. And he, that is the angel, who's standing with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, the angel swore by him who lives forever, the Father, the Ancient of Days, who created. Now, he commissioned the creation of the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And the angel said, there will be no more delay. No more chronos. The Greek word for delay here is time. No more waiting for time. No more. It's over. Jesus is waiting for the appointed hour to arrive to select and seal the 144,000. And when that hour arrives, the 144,000 will be sealed and Jesus will release the four angels when he says there's no more delay. God's wrath against this world will begin. Life as we currently know it will drastically, dramatically, and suddenly change. All right, the second adjacent, adjacent issue the 144,000 will not speak their own words. They will be given words to speak. This fact explains something that bothers some people. I've been asked many times, 
How can God use the pagans, people that aren't Christians? How can God leapfrog well people well studied in the Bible? Why does he do that? and choose ordinary people to speak for him during the Great Tribulation. Remember Gideon's army? Remember Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh? Well, let's look at this a little more thoughtfully. We know that there are sheep and goats in every religious body. In other words, there are sincere, faithful, honest-hearted people in every religious system. And Jesus acknowledged this when he was on earth. He told his disciples in John 10, 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. In other words, I have sheep that are not of Israel. They're not part of this religious body. And I must bring them also into my fold. That's what he's talking about in John 10, 16. They too, Jesus said, will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus knows every person on earth very well. He knows the number of hairs on our heads. And when Jesus presents himself to those whom he has selected, they will become believers in Jesus on a single day, just like the Apostle Paul did. Third, 144,000 won't be theologians. They won't be eloquent preachers or savvy businessmen and women. They will be common people, just like the uneducated fishermen that Jesus chose to be his apostles when he was on earth. Here's the point for doing this. The 144,000 do not need to be scholars or theologians. In fact, if they were, it would only frustrate them. God knows there are enough of these people on earth already. <laughs> <laughs> what Jesus needs are some mouthpieces. People who are willing to speak the words they are given without regard for the consequences. Jesus doesn't need theologians. He doesn't need Greek scholars. And he doesn't need, you know, high priests. He just needs some humble, sincere, honest mouthpieces because these people will not speak their words they will speak the words they are given to speak this is why revelation 14 5 is so interesting to me it says of the 144,000 no lie was found in their mouths they are blameless what does this mean it means the 144,000 will not deviate from the words given them, even though it will eventually cost them their lives. This is a most crucial point because the 144,000 will speak the testimony of Jesus. You see, if they were educated, the temptation would be to speak from your own body of knowledge as great and as magnificent as it might be. <laughs> if the 144,000 were powerful people, they would continue to exercise their power and they wouldn't be speaking the testimony of Jesus. They would be speaking their own thoughts and their own words. I hope you're beginning to get the point why Jesus has to choose the humblest and the meekest of people to do what he wants done. It is no small thing to be given words to say when they are in opposition to those around you, when it is antagonistic to everyone who knows you. It is no small thing to stand up and to clearly 
speak without deviation. And this is why Revelation 14.5 is so neat. There is no lie, no deviation from truth found in their mouths. It's awesome. Very awesome. Those who follow after the 144,000 will also suffer persecution. Notice how this works. In Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says, Then the dragon, we all know who the dragon is, that ancient serpent, the devil, he is enraged at the woman, and in this particular place of Scripture, the woman represents the people of God. See, there's two women in Revelation. There's the harlot, and there's this pure woman. Both women represent people. This, rep this woman represents the people of God. The harlot represents the people of Lucifer. So the dragon is enraged at the people of God, and he goes off to make war against the last, or the remnant, as it says in the King James Version, of her offspring. Now here are the offspring of the people of God. Here's what the remnant will be doing. They will obey God's commandments because they believe that God's authority is supreme, and they will hold to the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? We find in Revelation 19, it's the spirit of prophecy, and that's why these prophets, 144,000 prophets, the Holy Spirit rests upon them, and they're speaking the words of Jesus. And the remnant will be those who obey the, co the commandments, the Ten Commandments, because they believe that God's authority is highest, and they will hold to what the 144,000 are teaching and saying. The selection and empowerment of the 144,000 was presented to John as though he would be one of them. John vicariously experiences what they will experience. And we're going to study how this unfolds in Revelation 10 in our next uh, seminar segment. But for now, we've covered a lot of ground in our examination of Revelation uh, chapter 7. We've talked about the sealing of the 144,000. We've talked the great multitude. We've talked about the opening of the seventh seal and that entire prophecy from 7-1 through 8-1 and how that all lines up. Now I've been talking in part about some of the adjacent things and we're going to get into a new prophecy. I'm skipping over the seven trumpets right now because we want to study the 144,000 through their entirety so that you can understand how they fit so neatly into the story of the seven trumpets. So we're going to, in our next seminar segment, we're going to look into uh, Revelation 10.1, starting there, and we're going to examine how the 144,000 meet Jesus and what happens in that meeting. Well, may God bless you, is my prayer.